Welcome, everyone, to another installment of Chocolate Chat. I am Chocolate Yoda, spelled Y-O-D-D-A-H, because film studios are litigious. And with me today is a fellow podcast named Tim by Siegel. Uh, and uh, today we're going to talk about overcoming adversity. And uh, I, I haven't heard all the details of this story, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, before we begin, Tim, please introduce yourself. Tell us about your podcast, etc. So hi, I'm, I'm Tim Bysiegel, as he mentioned. Uh, I still love the name Chocolate Yoda. I think that's fantastic, and you're right. Uh, any other spelling would have you in more lawsuits than you could shake a stick at. Um, uh, and being a huge Star Wars fan as well, that I, that's another reason why I love the name. So it's just oh, it's okay. wonderful. So um, anyway, I'm the host of three podcasts. So I have Focused on Forward, which is uh, my original podcast, and we'll get into where that came from throughout the course of our conversation today. Um, but that really stemmed out of out of experiences where I needed something to kind of help me move forward in my own life and, and overcome some of the things that I was working on and working uh, working through. I guess is a better a better uh, way to put it. And, and then uh, I have two other shows. One's called Funny Science Fiction, which I am a member of a, a large Facebook group called, oddly enough, Funny Science Fiction. <laughs> and so we started a podcast for it and uh, our group is up over 165,000 members right now. Oh wow. And uh and so we have a really fun uh science uh science fiction based podcast with we talk about superheroes and fantasy related things. Because if you're watching the video and you see this wonderful wall behind me, I'm a little bit of a nerd. Uh those are all my yeah. Funko Pops uh that are Star Wars and superhero related. And then my other show that it's only in, in its, it's in its infancy, nine weeks in. Uh, it's called Pop Culture Addicts, where we talk to people all throughout music and movies, and we interviewed somebody, uh, comic book creators yesterday. So it's anything that's pop culture related that affects our lives. You know, having discussions with them about, you know, what were their influences and why do they, you know, why do they do what they do and what what do they appreciate about pop culture and things like that. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Now, is there a, a main website for all these, or is it on YouTube? So, Pop Culture Addicts and Funny Science Fiction are both on YouTube. Focused on Forward is technically on YouTube. For the first two seasons of the show, it's been audio only. And so okay. I, I throw up like a, an Apple iMovie of, uh, you know, moving pictures um, gotcha. over top of the audio. But uh, it's just there for, for people if they want to watch it on watch slash listen listen on uh gotcha. on, on youtube but uh audio for all three shows is available wherever you get your podcast from okay fantastic and uh you know i'll i'll get your links later and make sure that they are in the description thank you um so uh in in my uh coaching life because uh, my my real life counterpart is a keynote speaker seminar leader coach and consultant and uh, as a coach which is my favorite thing to do um I obviously deal with people overcoming adversity, and of course, uh, in my own life, I've I've had to overcome lots of it, uh, from racism uh, to health issues to you know being a gigantic idiot, all <laughs> all those kind of things. Um, so uh, I know that uh, you you have a few things that you could talk about, but uh, lay it out. Wh which story of overcoming adversity uh, speaks to you right now? Well, well, there's two, and they're kind of intertwined. And, and so uh, I'll start with the first half of it. Um, growing up, I was always a, a pretty healthy guy. I played pickup basketball two to four times a week, uh, especially on Sundays after work. I'd go, you know, had a big group that I'd go and play basketball with, run for, for two to four hours each each Sunday. I loved basketball. I loved playing basketball. Mm. And so, you know, I played a lot. And I'm not saying I was you know, particularly good at it. I just really enjoyed it. Right. Um, but anyway, in about my mid-30s, I started noticing that I was feeling like a, a – like a, I didn't know what it was, but something was happening in my chest. And my, my, I could feel my heart just – was something wasn't acting right. Something wasn't working correctly. And, uh, you know, being the very intelligent young man that I was – I ignored it because uh, clearly I'm familiar I was young with that was, syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, the dumb young man. Um, you know, but clearly I was healthy. Why would I ever need to go see a doctor? That was my logic. Right. Um, so 
you know, because it was one of those things where I, my, my chest felt weird, kind of felt a little fluttery and it would go away after a little while, but it was only happening like once every couple of months. It was like so intermittent. I didn't even really worry about it. And that was the thing. I was like, oh, you know, maybe I just swallowed air wrong. You know, I was trying to go through all these reasons in my head why it wasn't my heart, why it was something right. else, something. So uh, it went from being once every about six months to being once every couple of weeks to being uh, when I knew it was a problem is um, watching, staying up one night, uh, got home from basketball. I was going to watch Sunday night football. My wife uh, is a, a voracious party animal right up to about nine o'clock at night. And uh, <laughs> she goes to bed. <laughs> and so she went off to bed and I sat up in the chair you know, uh, our kids were all little at this point, and they went to bed too. And I sat out in the chair watching football, and then my heart started fluttering. Well, I'm I'm just sitting there watching football. Nothing's happening. I'm I'm watching football. Right. You know, I was not not like I was working out in the living room while this was happening. And it went all night long. Mm. And I knew something. I I couldn't sleep, but. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I let it go all night because I was like, well, if I, I know I'm going to have to go to the emergency room, something's, something's wrong, but I'm going to let my wife sleep for a couple more hours, see if I can, you know, sack, uh, sack out on the couch for a few minutes and, you know, then that never really happened. But I woke her up. We went to the emergency room and uh, they told me I had something called atrial fibrillation. Um, and my heart was way out of working, way out of sinus rhythm. And so my heart was trying to pump, but the, the nerve endings and, and, you know, enzymes in my heart were just not where they should have been doing what they should have been. And so instead of that, that crisp, boom, 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 you know, that you get with, with your heart, it was like, you know, just kind of all over the place. Right. Uh, and so that was the first time I ever had my heart chemically stopped and restarted. Oh, wow. Which, you know, I woke up when I, I had these, you know, the, the burn marks, the paddle marks on my chest and those itch later on, just so you know, <laughs> uh, you wear the wrong shirt, you'll know. Um, yeah. So that was, and that was referred to a heart specialist. And so I went and saw the heart specialist and, you know, they told me that uh, I definitely 100% had atrial fibrillation and I probably needed to do something about it. Yeah. And I went, Okay. <laughs> and I kind of ignored it because really? I was young. Even after that would, episode, that's that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, I was young and dumb. Very, very <laughs> dumb. So when you talked earlier in your introduction about doing things that were uh, incredibly stupid, yeah, that was <laughs> that was one of my moments of incredible stupidity. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, the next week I went back to work. You know, then I, you yeah. know, the I think uh, on Wednesday I think I took two days off. And I went back to work on Wednesday. And the following week, I'm at work, and I, I used to work for a door and hardware supplier. We worked, I sold architectural grade hardware to, you know, when you see these big factories getting built, the guys who sell the doors, the hinges and stuff, that was me. That's what I did. Gotcha. Okay. And so I was out back in the, the, the back of the shop sorting hardware for a job to make sure that, you know, everything was lettered and, you know, or numbered properly for each door so that, you know, the contractor could get it installed. But as I'm doing that, I noticed that my left hand started tingling. It was numb. And I kept, you know, kind of walking through doing the, the shake of the hand, trying to, right. you know, trying to get the, the feeling back. And, um, <laughs> uh, th and then I had, you know, th before long, you know, I, I had pain going up my left arm. I had it up and through my shoulder, up into my jaw. And uh, one of the guys who works at the shop with me, his name was Larry. Larry looked at me and goes, did, did, did you have a numb left hand? I said, yeah. He goes, I noticed that you're kind of clenching your jaw a lot. Does your jaw hurt too? I said, yeah. He goes, you need to go to the hospital. He goes, do you want me to drive you? I was like, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll go see. I'll just go to my doctor's office. So I drove, th I got in my own car, drove 30 minutes the opposite direction <laughs> of the hospital to go to my doctor's office. I walked in and uh, they said, well, what's the matter? I said, well, my left hand is numb and I have a pain going all the way up to my jaw. 
I have Pain never seen my side. shirt. And, and yeah. radiating. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the classic signs of something wrong with your heart. But I was 33, 34 years old. I, in my mind, there was no way that this was a, a possibility of anything going wrong. Well, uh, fun fact, if you're at your doctor's office or any medical facility and you tell them that you have pain and numbness in your left side of your body and radiating up to your jaw, you will be surprised how quickly they will cut your t-shirt off. And they don't care that it was a brand new Nike t-shirt that you just bought. <laughs> that thing yeah. was in two halves on the floor before I could blink. Wow. And uh, next thing I know, I'm getting all these, you know, these things attached to me and they're checking me out and... Um, they called an ambulance and, you know, to take me back to the hospital the other half hour direction uh, yeah. that I had just come from because I, again, incredibly smart young man. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I had to go to the hospital. I had to stay the night for observation. Come to find out it was not a heart attack. It was, um, I have a uh, uh, hiatal hernia as well. Oh, wow. And so what, what can happen sometimes with a hiatal hernia is when that um, when some of the 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 skin there from uh, in the the F esophagus the 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 sphincter there at the bottom of that I can't remember what the they have a esophageal sphincter there you go gotcha. um, when some of the skin falls into that sphincter and and squeezes on it and and closes up like it's trying to do its job it, the pain can radiate out into the the soft tissue your heart is soft tissue the smooth right. muscle. And so it can mimic a heart attack. But at the same time I'm having all this, I was also having an atrial fibrillation episode. And so I had all this going on. And so it was throwing all these numbers off. And But, you know, uh, another fun fact, if you don't need nitro uh, and you get three of them on the, on the uh, ambulance ride down because they're positive you're having a heart attack and they're trying to get it under control, when they finally get you under control and the nitro leaves your system, you are going to get the worst migraine you have ever had in your oh, life. Wow. Because, you know, nitro is designed, designed to, you know, explode your, your blood vessels open so that, you know, they can, the blood can flow freely. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem. My blood vessels were not constricted. I was not having a heart attack. I was having a fake heart attack at the time. Right. I was having a, a true ep, uh, atrial fibrillation episode. But yeah, so when that came down, I, that I, today is the worst headache I have ever had in my life. You could not, I, nobody could talk in the room above a whisper. I couldn't have the lights on. Oh wow! Nothing. It was it was awful. And um, how long did that last? Uh, that was a good couple hours. Oh wow! Yeah. Mm. That, yeah, that it was about I think two. I think about at least about three hours. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. um, and they sent me after that. They sent me back to the, to the heart specialist. You know, so I had a nice, nice return visit with him and, and, uh, he was just thrilled to see me again cause I had disregarded his previous, uh, <laughs> right. his, his previous instructions. Right. Um, and, and so what it basically came down to is that, um, my condition c continued to get worse and worse and worse over the next year to year and a half. They tried different medicines, different, um, non-surgical procedures and, and, and things to try and correct this. Because kind of you know for what I for what I had it, surgery is at that time I mean we're talking twelve years ago surgery for that was a lot more uh, invasive than it is now. Gotcha. So um, by the time I actually went in for it eight eight seven eight years ago, um, excuse me, uh, it was a, a much different procedure. Right. So I, here's, I'm, I'm a guy who went from working 60 to 80 hours a week at my job, playing basketball a couple times a week, being a, trying to be as much of a fun and full-time dad as I can with my two boys at, at that time. My daughter uh, was just recently born. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a dad and, you know, be a fun dad and do as much things as I could with them. And my heart said no. Right. I went from working 60 to 80 hours a week to not being able to walk from one end of the house to the other without being exhausted. I went from having one atrial fibrillation episode once every couple of weeks to having 15 to 20 episodes a day at the Oof, end. Man. 
Yeah. So and so now this is this is after you've uh, been a year to a year and a half of trying to address this. Correct. Right. Wow. We we had tried uh, four or five different medicines. We had tried um, different therapies and techniques. We had tried all these different things. And so basically, what it was was it came down to. Okay, you need to have this heart procedure. Um, which at that point, I, I no longer cared. I was like, just do whatever you got to do. Let's let's get this fixed. You know, because I'm right. I'm I'm in my early to mid thirties at this point, and I'm kind of stuck to the recliner in my house. Right. Yeah. Your quality you know, not, of life I, sounds like it was almost nothing. Yeah, it was gone. It was gone. Um. So, I mean, this, this whole time, you know, so not only am I dealing with the physical side of things, but then there's the mental, emotional side of things. Because sure. when, I, you know, and I took great pride in, in being uh, a father who provided and, and, and a hard worker and, and being there for my family and, and doing all those things. And not just because that was the, the societal norm around me, but because, you know, um, my natural father wasn't there for me growing up. And so I always, in my head, in my heart, I was going to be anything and everything that he wasn't for my kids. Right. I you know, totally when relate I, when to I, that. Yeah. So uh, it was it was very, you know, uh, emasculating, really, uh, yeah. to go from being what I felt was being a good provider and, and a good husband and a good father uh, to my wife and my children to being the guy who sits on the chair. Yeah, and and frankly, the the psychological aspects of what you're talking about can be way worse than the physical aspects. Because oh yeah. Because what what you're describing is this this uh, set of identities that you had. Like this is who you were, and your your whole world basically was eviscerated, and yes. and now. And now you're 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 in this you know I'm I'm not what I used to be I don't know what I am I don't know what's about to happen, uh, so mm-hmm. what went what happened from that point? So so from there uh, we went and I we had this I had this procedure done, uh, and it's called uh, um, an ablation, where basically they 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 froze one portion of my heart they burnt another, um, and in the doctor's nicest words basically they're hot wired my heart. Uh, to, to kind of make it work like yeah. it should, and, yeah. and it worked. Um, in the eight years, seven eight years since I've had the procedure, I've had zero atrial fibrillation issues. I've uh, been able to return to work. The only difference is, is that I no longer have the stamina that I used to have. That is, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, but I was able to go back and do a lot of things that I normally used to do. Uh, going back and playing basketball like I used to, that that has not returned. That has not come back. Um, but, you know, I, I was able to go to work. I was able to do all these, you know, do different things. I was able to be there for my family and in, in other ways. <laughs> and and um, what was that process like? So now now you've had the procedure. and Because I, I had uh, brain surgery in 2012. So I, I am familiar with the idea of now starting the road to recovery uh, just on the physical side. So what was that yeah. like for you? Well, it was a slower process than I had hoped. Uh, I'm a very impatient person. Uh, I very much, when I when I want to do something, I, I want it done now. I want to go do it now. Let's go take care of it now. Why aren't we doing it now? Why isn't it done? Let's, you know, that kind right. of thing. Um, and so my thought was that, you know, having this procedure, and, and I don't know why I allowed myself to think this, but I did. I allowed myself to think that this procedure was going to be the magic pill uh-huh. where, you know, I, I do this, I get this done. I have this little procedure and I say little, uh, it was an $85,000 heart surgery. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it was not little. Um, but I have this procedure done and it's going to fix everything. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to return to, to work the next week. Right. Skip out of the That's hospital life... and go directly to the basketball court. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That, right. You know, that's how my brain works, but that's not how life works. Sure. And I, um, it was a slower process than I wanted. I had to first kind of get myself to the standpoint of understanding that the work that I used to do wasn't going to be the work that I was doing moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it just so happened that at the same time, my my oldest son, um, as I was coming out of that, 
started having some uh, emotional issues that needed to be addressed. And um, so my wife and I talked about it and I decided to become a stay at home dad. And I was started working from home, um, doing a couple different things online to, to make money and do some things, but allowing myself to be there when the kids got up, I took them to school. I picked them up from school. I was there for them, uh, you know, each and every day because that, that was what we felt was going to be required to, you know, in, in addition to finding, uh, the proper counseling and therapy that would be needed to help out. And, you know, I'm happy to say that that has worked out well. He's, he's, you know, he's now, uh, 23. Yeah. I'm doing, I got to do the math here. 23. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, he's, he's doing really well for himself and, uh, you know, he's recently married, bought a house. He's doing well. So I had to, I had to kind of reformulate life in my own head and to, and to accept that there were going to be some limitations or restrictions on me that were not previously there. Right. And that also required some, some adjustment, you know, mentally and emotionally to me because I used to, you know, in my mind, I lived without restriction, without limitation before that, right. you know, my restriction, my only re- restrictions and limitations I felt before that were ones that I had placed upon myself right? because right. I wouldn't allow myself to do this thing or to do that thing. But now I was having outside forces, you know, telling me that I couldn't do these yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. So take us through that as far as, because that, that, that's the part that was very challenging to me as well. And I, and, and basically everyone that I've ever known that had a, a similar experience, whether it was, you know, getting into a car crash or major surgery or, or mm-hmm. being mugged or whatever it is, uh, there's, there's a mental, uh, an emotional component to it. Um, and, people tend to have a, a different pathway to get through that part. But what was it for you? What were, what was the internal dialogue that you were having to address these issues? Well, it was very much a, a challenge of my own self-worth. Um, because again, now in my mind, I had no reason why I couldn't go back to work doing the work that I was doing before, uh, even though I knew that I was staying home with a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times in our society and in the, you know, there's, there's still a stigma around stay at home dads. There's still a, you know, you know, when we would tell people even in our own families that I was staying home from work, you know, they looked at me like I was lazy. Um, and I, you know, and that was the hardest thing for me was to accept the fact that I wasn't being lazy. I wasn't being a, a bad provider because in my mind that was the biggest hurdle right there was that I had to accept the fact that I wasn't being a bad provider. I was providing in another way. Mm-hmm. I was, I was doing something different to support my family and to help my family. And that's a very hard hurdle to jump for some people. It was a hard hurdle for me to jump because mm-hmm. my brain kept trying to tell me that my self-worth was tied into the paycheck that I brought home at the end of the week. You know, um, and, and trying to get my mind to shift from the paycheck side of things and looking at it from a financial standpoint to the other things over here that I could offer my family by my, my consistently staying home and working from home and doing all those things. Um, that was a, that was a pretty big shift because those are those, those two worlds are different lanes completely. And trying yeah. to make the adjustment from, you know, the work a day week and, and all the challenges and things that you go through in that to, um, you know, working from home and I have a computer at home and I have all these different things that I'm doing here. But, oh, you know, I'm going to go do some laundry and uh, I'm going to get dinner started and, right. you know, all these different things. It was hard for me to accept it on, uh, for myself and then to know that there was a struggle with how other people perceived me. Uh, also made it a little bit challenging because it's not that I was seeking their approval, but I didn't like the thought of being looked down upon for doing something for my family. 
Well, yeah, and this is, you know, psych 101 kind of stuff. Like, you know, significance is important to people. Contribution is important to people. Uh, but human beings are extremely social animals. And, you know, our standing in the community is, is very important to us. So, so it makes sense. So you, you, so you had these challenges uh, that, that were uh, part and parcel of these changes that you went through. So how did you, how did you get yourself to the other side? So here you are, you have a new paradigm for your life. Uh, you have a new paradigm for how you think people perceive you and certainly how you perceive yourself. So how did you move past that? Well, part of my personality is, is that I'm extremely stubborn. Um, and at a certain point in my mind, and a lot as I have in a lot of things in my life, I just had to screw them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was and that. Now that didn't fix everything. That didn't take all the all the issues right. away. But it helped right. me uh, find my own purpose again in what I was doing, and most importantly, why I was doing what I was doing. I no longer was looking for the validation from everybody. The only validation I was then seeking was from my wife. If mm. she was happy with what right. you know. Are you are you comfortable with what we're doing for family, and yeah. our, on our family dynamic now? Are you happy with this? Are you comfortable? With, those were the biggest things to me, because if my wife was comfortable and my wife was happy, I didn't care if somebody else thought what we were doing was odd or weird or you know or that I should have been the one going to work and she should have been the one staying home or 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 or, or. those things those things started to fade off in the distance, and so what I had to do was adjust my mindset, adjust my vision, who I was, who was I staying home for? What was the reason for me being, you know, a stay at home dad? And once I kind of got that wrapped in my head, you know, I kind of made that uh, adjustment. It was a lot easier for me to then say, screw them and move forward and right. just do what I had to do. Sure. Uh, because those were, those were the things that were now in my rear view. Right. So it, it sounds like part of the process was going from an external focus to an internal focus, because that's really yeah. what the phrase screw them kind of encompasses. It's it, you're saying, <laughs> you know what, why am I trying to please these people when I really just have to please myself and I have to please my partner? And as long as we're right. good, you know, everything else is good. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting to me that um, what you describe is is. Um, uh, what's what's typically uh, referred to as the hero's journey and being a Star Wars fan you'll appreciate this but almost every story ever told whether you're talking about Jesus Christ or the epic of Gilgamesh or Beowulf or any right. any story or anything any film you see any TV uh, show you see any uh, book that you read uh, the hero's journey structure is there you know you started out as one version of Tim and then you met with adversity and you figured out how to overcome the adversity, and now you're a new version of Tim. You know, that's that's a very, very uh, Reader's Digest version of the hero's journey. But that's really, <laughs> but that's really what it is, right? Like right, you, right. you know, you, you come out the other side and uh, uh, you're changed by your experience. Oh, and yeah. so now, and so if, if you had to, uh, give someone else advice for this kind of thing like you know you someone that's uh, about to uh, uh experience or or has already experienced a major change in their life whether it's a health issue whether whatever whatever kind of issue mm -hmm. it could be uh what what would be your advice to them well before i answer that i have to say first off i've never thought of myself as as luke skywalker until this moment and i you can't are. wait to go home and I can't wait to go home and tell my wife that that I'm Luke Skywalker. She is never going to forgive you for this, but it's going to happen. Uh, all right, all right. But to answer your question, um, you know, so th what we find in life is that most issues are not single layers. There's multiple layers to every issue that we face. So for me, it was it was a hard issue. It was a loss of income. It was a loss of work. It was, um, uh, you know, I, I felt emasculated. Uh, by by the things that I had going on in my life, and so there was a lot of there was a lot of components to what I I felt going on. Um, so the biggest thing for me, it, you know, and and, I, and anybody that's going through this, and and if you can identify with anything that I've talked about, 
um, then maybe you'll feel the same way, is that it had, and it's just what you had said earlier, it had to come from a change of focus. I had to stop worrying about what the inward views were. I had to worry about the outward views. You know, I had to worry about, I had to start, I, we started a saying in my house that uh, if it doesn't affect the four walls of this home, I don't care. Mm. You know, uh, and, and so there, you know, that, that, that went with a lot of different things that were going on, whether it was in the news and in the real world around us, or it was people's perceptions of things that were going on in our home. If their thoughts and feelings about what we were doing didn't affect the four walls of our home, the only thing that affects the four walls of our home is us and what we do. Right. So we had to, we had to start adjusting and, and going for more of an outward view of things that, that affected us and how we interacted with one another and allowing this, because really it was a new dynamic uh, to our relationship and a new dynamic to our family structure. Allowing this new dynamic to take hold and, and giving it a chance to, to mature. Because, you know, a lot of times when, when, the, when people have a change in what they're doing, they stop early on because they don't see immediate results or they right. don't, or the results are there, but they don't see what they were hoping for or see what they, th they think they should see. And so I'm fortunate enough that my wife is, is far more intelligent than I am and she's far more patient than I am. And so when I was ready to throw in the towel at different times, she was willing to just say, well, you know, instead of doing 80, let's do 55 and let's, let's slow down a little bit and see what, you know, let's see what we can do with this and let's see what we can do with that. Uh, like I said, she's an incredibly intelligent woman. Um, mm -hmm. The only, I'm her only questionable life choice uh, as far as I can tell. <laughs> so, right. but you but, know what, uh, but more, more than her intelligence is obviously her compassion because, you know, um, one of the most consistent themes to this conversation is change. And mm -hmm. as we've seen in the last 20 months of the COVID pandemic, uh, most people don't handle change very well. And so, right. you know, this experience was obviously not just a change for you. It was a change for your wife. And uh, let's face it, some wives would have bailed, you know. Right. And uh, so you, you know, so uh, her her questionable life choice is obviously your very good life choice in a partner. So you know, she's very uh, much kudos to fortune. both of you. But, you know, like it, when I when I talk to people about their relationships, uh, most of the issues come from. Uh, people that are not rowing in the same direction, uh, you know, yeah. and, and obviously you are, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, we, we try very hard and, and you know, he, here's the thing we're, we're humans. We have our moments, um, you know, and we often talk about, you know, us being, you know, uh, two ships sailing in the, in opposite directions. Cause just cause our, our, that's our, our mental, our personality. She's, you know, we're, we're Donnie and Osmond, you know, Donnie Marie Osmond. We're, you know, a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. Uh, we couldn't I be more separate. On, yeah. We couldn't be more different if we tried in, in most things. I'm impatient. She is patient. Uh, you know, um, you know, then I could go on and on, but, uh, you know, she is definitely the yin to my yang. And, and, and I think that's what helps us is that, uh, we're able to see things from each other's perspectives and, and look at life from each other's viewpoints. And one of the, th the greatest lessons that she's taught me over our, our uh, nearly 24 years of marriage is that life is about perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's not always the moment that you're living in. It's about the perspective of the moment. And so um, it, you'll hear me talk about this on, in a lot on, on Focus on Forward is, you know, our perspective of the situation we're in. Because when, we're, when we enter a situation, our perspective is usually pretty grim. We look at it and, and we can only see the negative side of things. And so uh, one of the things that she's helped me to do is to alter my perspective. Look for the silver lining. What's, what's the good that can be had out of this negative situation? You know, so for me, uh, going through this heart situation and going through this change of life and, and everything else... The, the silver lining the, to my, my story is that I, I not only uh, got to try different experiences in life that I would never have, have had it, it, had I been working for somebody else, but being self-employed and working from home, 
I got to spend time with my children that I would never have gotten in, in any other way. And you can't put a price on that. Oh, man. I, I wouldn't trade that for, well, anything. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. And, so. you know, the uh, I, I am very often reminded of the quote um, from Shakespeare through Hamlet, uh, where he says, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Right. And the second quote from Helen Keller, uh, and I, I, I don't know if I'm going to butcher it, but the idea of the quote is, uh, when one door closes, another door opens, but people very often stare at the closed door and miss the open one, <laughs> you right. know, and it, it sounds like uh, that's part of what you're talking about is that, uh, first of all, you recognize that it's it's not all about the situation. It's really about how you're thinking about the situation. Right. Um, and, you know, when the you, your doors in life changed, instead of just staring at the closed door, you went and looked to see if there was an open door somewhere else. And that's really what it is. You know, Anthony Robbins asked this question when people are describing a terrible thing that they're going through. He says, you know, he, he'll ask, what's good about this? And most of the time people say nothing. And then he says, well, what could be good about it? And I find right. that to be a very valuable question when you're going through something like this, because, you know, in the midst of the thing that you're going through, it always seems terrible. It always seems hopeless. So... If you ask that question, what could be good about this? Uh, the, the answers are surprising very often. And, and you answered those questions. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you now uh, have a, a, a different sense in terms of uh, a way to provide for your family. You have more time with your children. Uh, my right. guess is that your relationship with your wife deepened because of this, this uh, terrible situation that you went through, that you both went through. So these these are things that people don't think about when they're just looking at how horrible something is. They, they, they don't consider what great could come out of it. Absolutely. You know, and, and uh, the quotes that you threw out there made me think of a couple others. Um, so I'll, I'll share a couple of my favorite quotes with you, uh, if you don't mind. Please. But uh, one of them, and I, I don't know who said this or when it started or when it originated or if it was just one of those colloquial things that just kind of grew over time. But there's the saying that uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. Mm. You know, I have no idea the, the, the etymology of that, where it came from or anything. But I love that because uh, in our own minds, half the time we, like you're saying, we, we, we don't see the open door. We only see the darkness of the closed door and we can't allow our minds to, to focus until that light starts to shine. And, and that was kind of one of the things I had to remember is that when I was in the, the depths of, of my own mind going through my, you know, sitting in the chair and, you know, and, and not feeling good and all these things, I, that, I don't remember, I think it was one of my buddies said that to me. He goes, well, you know, hey, it's always darkest before the dawn. And he just kind of said it in passing. But it right. was one of those things that just kind of, kind of played through my mind again over and over is that eventually it's, the dawn is going to come. There's going to be an mm -hmm. opportunity for me to see where I can go, what I can do. And unfortunately, yeah, it, it, the relevance to me was that, yeah, unfortunately, I was sitting here, sitting still, not able to do something, but there would be the dawn and the light would come and it would show me my path and where I needed to go. Right. And so, again, had to learn patience. Uh, and then the other uh, quote has to do with your Helen Keller quote. Uh, and it comes from, I believe, Milton Berle, that uh, when life when life closes a door, just build another. Yeah. Uh, so... And I'm pretty sure I slaughtered that one. I don't think it's exactly that, but uh, <laughs> we get so, the meaning. Yeah, but yeah. That's, my, uh, that's truly my apologies, what it is. post mortem. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, it, it really um, f I have found in my own life and and in the lives of of all the people that I've spoken to over the years um, that everything that you're describing is is absolutely true. You know, the the only people that that I see. Uh, that are either consistently miserable uh, or or just, you know, have kind of given up are people that are not looking for a solution. Right. They, they're, they're ju they've just decided that they're going to be in the problem. 
you know, whatever that is, you know, they're, they're just right. going to just, just lay down and just kind of wait to die. And, you know, the only reason that they get up every day is because, you know, that's their habit or whatever, you know, and right. I find that to be an extremely sad existence. And yet um, everyone I know that has done what you did, what, what I have had to do as well, which is say, hey, you know, let me find a way. Let me find the answer mm -hmm. To these issues and and I'll, I'll find a way to address them i don't know what's going to happen i don't know what what changes i'm going to go through uh i i don't even know if i'll succeed at any of this but i just right. know that i have to try to find a solution to these issues and those people tend to be the happiest people that i know yeah you know it's funny as you're saying that one of the things I, i've said to my kids for years and years and they're probably sick of me saying this to them but it's one of the models in life that I live by. It doesn't matter how you fall. It matters that you get up. Now, the, yeah. the, 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 the strength of that saying is, is, you notice I didn't say how you, it doesn't matter how you get up. It just matters that you get up. Your get yeah. up might not be successful and you might fall back down as you're trying to get up. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the point is, is to never just lay there. The point is to, to get up, dust yourself off and find a way to move forward. And, and so I've, you know, my, I've said that to my kids over and over again as they were growing up and, and they make mistakes as kids do, you know, as they're learning about life and they're trying to, you know, spread their wings and stretch out and grow and, and do those things. You know, I'd, I'd say it to them, Hey, you made a mistake. You fell down. It doesn't matter that you fell. It matters that you get up. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that applies to anything too, what, you know, that we're doing in life and it, you know, and it was uh, unfortunate that I had that saying too, because that was a couple my wife said that to me a couple times as I was sitting there feeling very sad for myself and what right. I was going through and, and all these different things, you know, she, she said, what would you say to the kids? I'm like, really, <laughs> <laughs> really, you're going to bring that to me now. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And, and that's a variation of the, uh, uh, quote from, well, his, his real name was Kung Fu Tzu and we know him as Confucius. Uh, he said, man's greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So, nice. yeah, I, I happen to agree with that 100%. Nice. Yeah. All right. So any any final thoughts uh, uh, on this or anything else on your mind? Well, um, I am always one to promote uh, positive mental health. Uh, so uh, one of the other uh, brief lessons, I, or briefly, one of the other lessons that I learned from this was the power and the importance of mental health. Yeah. Um, now I did, this wasn't what the instance that I, cause again, being the, uh, really intelligent, dumb young man that I was, uh, even though I'd gone through all these things and I'd had some challenges to my own, own, own mental and emotional state, this wasn't what eventually got me into counseling and therapy, but, um, it should have. And I wish that I would have gone back looking back on things. I wish that after I had gone through these, these things that I went and sat down and talked with a counselor. Um, right. but uh, yeah. So really just to, um, to know the power and the, the importance of counseling and therapy and don't allow the, the social stigmas around you to deny you the opportunity to be happy. Yeah. Add it to the list of, of things that are stigmatized, right? It's, it's, it's one of the most bizarre yeah. things, you know, if, if someone, you know, cuts their finger, uh, they put a bandaid on it. If they break their bone, they put a cast on it. Um, if they have some kind of disease, they'll take medication. But if their brain chemistry is off a little bit, then suddenly it's a whole different world and it's a problem and there's judgment. And it's just, it's just silly human stuff. Like that <laughs> makes absolutely no sense. Right. We're told to suck it up and move along instead of addressing the yeah. issue. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that's a guy thing too. Uh, and I, and oh, I totally relate. So. Like when you, when you talked about ignoring the problem, I totally relate to this. I mean, very quickly, uh, back in 2016, I remember, uh, being out with a sales manager and, uh, we had to walk a few blocks to, uh, to go, uh, to this meeting. And, um, I was, I normally walked very slowly, especially in the summertime, cause I'm in a suit and I don't want to sweat and all this other stuff. Um, and this guy just had this really fast pace of walking and I was going to keep up with him. And I, and I suddenly got a, a real severe pain in my chest and, you know, I, I just, 
I had a moment and I had a conscious thought. I would rather die than ask this guy to slow down. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, and by the way, yeah. I wasn't 30. I was 52 when, when this happened. So, you know, the, you know yeah. as I like to say, testosterone ruins men at an early age, you know. And, You're um, not wrong. Yeah, and so I, I totally relate to the stubbornness uh, that guys have and, and that – uh, that attitude that can be, you know, really debilitating, which is like, you know, suck it up. Don't, you know, don't, don't show your weakness, never let them see you right. sweat, all that other stuff. And as I've gotten older, um, uh, I've, I've come to accept that, you know, we have these 1100 human emotions for a reason, you know, evolution did a great job in, uh, giving us the capability to react to things and, and feel things. And so I'm just going to experience all of my emotions. And, you know, if if fear is one of them, is if vulnerability is one of them, then that's OK. You know, sometimes you've right. got to be it's OK to be fearful. It's OK to be vulnerable, you know, and, and like any other emotion, you know, they're they're transient. So they're going to come and go. Right. Um, and that, and that's something that I think. Um, whether it's through coaching or through therapy or any kind of counseling that people can discover, like just to be whatever you are authentically in, in every moment, uh, that, that you're presented with. And right. I think, you know, people will find that their lives will get easier and better as a result. Absolutely. I'll co-sign yeah. on all of that. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Tim. This has been an excellent conversation. Well, thank you um, for having me. You know, yeah, I, I, I always love speaking to uh, interesting people with interesting stories. And I find that just about everybody has an interesting story, but yours was particularly interesting. So thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, once again, everybody, this has been Chocolate Chat. Peace, love, and granola. We'll talk to you soon. Uh -huh.